Hey everyone, welcome to my first whatever this is. So I've been kind of inspired by the Heart Usagi podcast to try out something similar myself. And I thought this would be a great format to ask uh, a question that uh, I was thinking about a little while ago. Uh, I'll talk about the question in the actual audio, but I wanted to do this intro. So this is basically a podcast, but I'm posting it on YouTube. I figure I already have a YouTube channel. I already have subscribers that come here. This isn't going to be my new regular format. I'll still, of course, be trying to get videos out there. But I wanted to bring something different to the channel because why not? Doing doing something different can be entertaining and it might be a success. So hopefully you enjoy it. This is part one of what could be a three-part webcast, but it all depends the kind of reaction that I get from it. Hopefully you find the conversation fun to listen to. And if I get enough positive feedback, I'll keep working at posting the rest of the conversation. I also want to apologize for the audio quality. It's a real mix, and that's partly my fault for trying to do things as cheap as possible. But who knows if this goes over well, and if I decide to do another one, I'll probably invest the little amount of money that it takes to uh, get something of a bit better quality. And that's it. I hope you enjoy. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another video blog of mine, although this one has uh, a lot less video and is more focused on the audio. The reason for that is I'll be asking a question, and asking and answering this question with me is my good friend Mike. Hey, Mike. Hi. How's it going? Good, good. Uh, so the question I was thinking, I was, I was thinking about um, general social commentary people have been making uh, for years, really, about all different kinds of things, uh, whether it be um, uh, mostly around the entertainment industry. When you think of movies of today for the longest time, people have been saying, you know, the movies of today suck, and it's the old movies, the classics are where it's at, and uh, same with music, uh, same with technology. You know, every time they come out with something new, it doesn't work as well as the old thing, but the question that... Um, I was thinking about was around games today and people complaining about how games today are no good uh, compared to all the old ones. And then I got really thinking about what games bring today and the question, the question was, aren't all games today awesome? Now to answer that question, it started to expanding into a whole bunch of different questions and facets of, of, of this um, and, and how it all ties into games of old versus games of today, which all ladder up to this question. Uh, the first thing that got me thinking is com comparing it to other mediums. So uh, like movies, like technology, um, because we always think that the movies of yesteryear are better than the ones of today. But are they really, or is it just our nostalgia that keeps uh, fond memories of what we saw when we were first being exposed to these things uh, that tell us they're the better ones? And now that we've seen it all, we're just seeing it all again now that we're older and we're kind of tired of it. And that's why we say movies of today are no good. What do you think, Mike, as far as other mediums and other products go? Well, that's a fascinating question and um, an exceptionally difficult one to answer. I mean, in the purest altruistic sense, absolutely, yes. By their mere existence, um, all games today are awesome. I mean, walk into any EB Games, GameStop, I guess they're called now, right, and, and watch the, you know, the sizzle reel of any game running on any system sitting there in the front of the store, and you are almost guaranteed to be wowed and blown away. Um, by the fidelity of the graphics, uh, the immersion of the sound, and, and whatnot. But, I mean, you know, but under that rationale, all food is awesome, all air is awesome, <laughs> all water is awesome. But there is polluted air, shitty food, fouled water. It's really, to me, I mean, I guess it's all a matter of perspective and appetites. Uh, yeah, 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 for sure. Um, and... Yeah, what what you're like, what you what you you're used to, um, and all what you experienced before will all kind of tie into that. Um, 
so what we've experienced before, so that got me thinking about, um, one of the things that I was thinking about is uh, all the old games and uh, some of the philosophies that I've come to hold playing video games for, uh, I don't know, 30 or so years. Um, what have I come to think of them? And one of the things that I kind of hold dear is that a truly great game will always be great. So I think the best example um, is probably Tetris. And although it's not my personal favorite game of all time, I do think that in the grand scheme of things, it may be the best game of all time. Because if you think on the system, so it came out originally on the NES, um, and it was simple and yet addictive and fun, and anyone can get in and play, and there's, it's been reinvented and remade even in the past, I think, year or two, there was another remake that came out for the current gen systems, and everyone's still playing it, and everyone's still having fun with it. You can't say that about all the games. Uh, I can't say that, at least, about all the games I played as a kid. Some of them that I thought were great then, I look back now and go, I don't know what was the matter with me, thinking that that was great. But the really great ones will always be great. They won't become bad if they were truly awesome way back when. I agree. I desperately want to agree. I really, truly do. But for every Tetris, there's a combat. You know, I remember sitting down that first day when I got my Atari 2600, and that should tell you how roughly how old I am. Um, and my mind as a young boy being blown away by the animations and the sound effects, and it felt like I was in gulfed in a real sense of combative warfare with my older brother. And and although now I can go back and play Tetris and still it can still kick my ass and I can still appreciate it for the awesome mind-bending puzzle awesomeness that it is, um, combat sucks. <laughs> I'm it. Combat sucks. And it's only fun, say, at a frat house party with a bunch. So I don't know. It really depends on how you perceive it. If, if you played it back in the day, it might still seem great. However, if you're brand new, you just, you know, jumped on the video game boat, for example, as a young adult or a young a kid, uh, you might not be able to look past, like, say, the antiquated mechanics or the janky animations, if, if it's a game advanced enough to even have animations, you know. I, I think, honestly, the gamers of today really need to co be coerced into seeing the greatness of some of this stuff. Now, I temper that comment with the resurgence of sort of that um, the indie game market that has become uh, uh, a market unto itself and is about to even get bigger with the launch of the Ouya and things like that. If you're not familiar, uh, we can talk about the Ouya. I'm sure you are. You're a knowledgeable oh. guy. Yeah, I know the, the Ouya. The Ouya is you know, positioning itself to be the indie game darling, right? Uh, every game that comes out on it has a, a free-to-play mode, and a lot of the games, I've already watched a lot of videos on YouTube about all the games that are coming out, and they all tend, a lot of them tend to have this retro sense to them, sensibility to them, on, not unlike um, Retro City Rampage, if you've, if you've played that one. I'd say the more we indoctrinate today towards the, the retro quaintness of these sort of boutique games that are coming out, then I think we can shift the paradigm and prove your, you know, let's call it a thesis, a truly great game will always be great. But I think there's a barrier to entry, like um, a book with complicated language. You know, without a Coles Notes, there's this brick wall in front of modern readers, say, older books. Like, um, I think of Clockwork Orange for an example. You know, fantastic book, fantastic movie, but would uh, a modern reader um, with the attention span of a, a teetsy fly be able to get past that language barrier? And it's in video game terms, it's a visual language barrier or, a, or an interface language barrier. And maybe I'm rambling, but... No, I see what you're saying because, you know, I, I think the, um, Shakespeare is a pretty good example, I'm sure. A lot of the language used then, uh, you know, you didn't require an English major when he was alive to figure it out. 
<laughs> it was actually like, lowest common denominator language, in fact. <laughs> Everyone could go and listen to what it was. And I think of Macbeth as probably my favorite play, but it, it could also be simply because that's the one that, um, uh, you know, the, the teacher that uh, studied it with us in English class maybe spent more time to make it easier to understand. And since I understand it more, it's quite possible it's just the one <laughs> that I like the most. Um, when I think of my own kids, to your point, I think as far back as they'll go willingly is PS2 stuff. So they still like playing uh, games on uh, the PS2. But um, the farther you go back, the less time that they spend with it. I've shown them things on uh, the Intellivision, um, or at least my oldest son I had, um, and he hasn't wanted to go back to it. So, um, and the thing about this V-Smile that we have, it's all about the content at hand, because it's all based around characters and movies and, and TV shows that they're familiar with, so that's kind of what draws them back to it. So, yeah, I could totally be fooling myself and thinking that, uh, you know, uh, I keep, when I go to the Intellivision, I always think of it, uh, Advanced Dungeons and Dragons Cloud Mountain. It's probably my, it's my favorite game on that system. Um, but no one today, <laughs> if they've never seen in the television before, would probably ever want to play it. Um, even though I think it's still great, it's probably only still great to me. So one of the things that um, uh, does make something great, though, and the reason that for me these older games hold up is because it's almost always about the gameplay for me. Cause that, and it's probably because about the story. I mean, those things are nice and uh, they're, you know, they're the bonuses that come with the gameplay, but for me it's still always about the gameplay. If you don't have a, an exciting, uh, interesting core gameplay mechanic that I'm interested in, it uh, doesn't have to be complex, it can be simple, but as long as I find it fun, then I'm going to be there and, and I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to enjoy it. So the benefits that newer games bring outside of that, I mean, definitely they can add to gameplay with you know, as processor power is, becomes more powerful and you can have bigger games in larger areas, but it's not about, uh, as someone, I can't remember who it was, maybe you remember, someone in the relatively um, prominent in the game industry said, you know, we can't go any farther with the system, but the games of today until we get more realistic visuals. And I just disagree with that completely because that's was, just... Sorry to interrupt you. I, I think it was the president of 2K Games who said that. And it's not a surprise. Mm -hmm. and I might be incorrect, but I'm pretty sure it was the, the VP or whatever of 2K Games. Because, um, I mean, I go back to Cirque Satari. Whenever I think I, my go-to game of the simplest gameplay mechanic of something that I can just get in play for literally for hours still to this day uh, is Cirque Satari. If you haven't played it, it's um, a paddle control game, you know, which is another dinosaur. You, you never see a custom controller with a paddle on it anymore, like a, a circular dial on it anymore. And it's just back and forth, sending the clowns on the seesaw, popping balloons. And even then, you had to use your imagination to imagine them as clowns, as depicted on the box art. Square is the top of the screen. <laughs> I had to use my imagination that they were balloons. Yet still, I can, um, uh, six hours... Boom, gone, if you put me down in front of an Atari VCS and a Circus Atari cartridge. Oh, when I can still roll um, asteroids on Atari. To this day, I can still roll on the basic level, like the, the standard turn it on, reset the machine, level one asteroids. I can still roll that sucker, uh, what, 25 years later, 30 years later. So, yeah, I'm, you know, as much as I'm poo-pooing some of what you're saying, I'm still a, a retro nerd with like over a hundred Atari cartridges in the next room. But when I pluck them out, you know, let's say I pluck them out and show them to my nephew, um, who's 10, um, I, I don't even know how he sees them, right? He just looks at them quizzically like, what the hell are those, Uncle Mike, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I remember we were watching, um, I was watching Wreck-It Ralph with, uh, with my kids. And uh, they enjoyed the movie. They thought it was a lot of fun. So I thought I'd, I'd bring them down and show them uh, my favorite game on, on the original Nintendo system. And uh, when I told them, I'm like, hey, I want to show you something uh, afterwards. And, and my oldest would say, 
I know, you're going to show us a game, and it's going to be all blocky, just like Wreck-It Ralph. <laughs> like, oh, I just feel so old now, but never mind. <laughs> but I guess it's no different, really, than, um, say, you know, your grandparents trying to play you a Glenn Miller record. <laughs> Again, how flippin' old I am, but, I mean, uh, it was like big band music of, like, the third. Right. <laughs> you're just going to look at your grandparent like, oh, yeah, okay, Gramps. 